Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jenna Owens. I am the project assistant with the Getting Word African American Oral History Project here at Monticello. And today I am joined by Jeanette Patrick and Jamin Buskey, who are the co creators and co writers of the uh, podcast Intertwine the Enslaved Community at George Washington's Mount Vernon. And so today we're just going to talk a little bit about that podcast and just get into the nitty gritty and tell you guys about it and let you guys know how much more we can know about Mount Vernon and the enslaved community. And so it's going to be like a Q&A, but we are going to give a chance to the audience to ask questions also toward the end of the live stream. And so please feel free at any point if you have any questions to throw them into the comment section, then they'll get them to me and I'll get it to them. And so we'll get started real quick with our first question. And so I just want to ask and either of you can answer what inspired this podcast intertwined? Well, uh, Jenna, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll bat lead off here. And thanks very much for having us. And thanks very much for moderating and to the team at Monticello for having us today. We're excited to be here. And uh, Intertwined was born out of a long running exhibit at Mount Vernon called Lives Bound Together uh, that told the story of the enslaved community through objects, through uh, written narratives, through uh, videos with the descendant community and trying to understand what was like life like for the enslaved community at Mount Vernon, uh, really uh, beginning with when Washington assumes the management of Mount Vernon uh, in the 1750s through the end of his life and, and through the end of Martha's life. Uh, and it's also was an exhibit about how Washington came to grapple with the institution of slavery. Uh, he started out his life very much like any other Virginia planter, and very much believed in slavery as a core part of his identity, believed it was a social practice that was economically and politically uh, the right way to go. But by the end of his life, through various things that I think we're going to talk about, his attitudes change. And so the idea was uh, once that exhibit was coming down, because exhibits only last for about 18 months, it actually lasted a lot longer because it was so popular and, and so critically important to the story we were telling at Mount Vernon, that there was a, a conversation about how is it going to live on. And one of the reasons or one of the things we decided was that it would live on as a podcast. And could we take all of that research that was done to build that exhibit, but also build on recent research since the exhibit's creation to produce something new that would uh, be available for a much wider audience for people who could never come uh, or who might not be able to come to Mount Vernon. Yeah. And so you kind of answer my next question, but like, <laughs> why choose the podcast form instead of like a book or I don't know, a YouTube series or whatever it may be? Yeah, I think that we thought a podcast would be a great way to help engage a wider audience. Um, as Jim said, that was not able to come to Northern Virginia. We also wanted to, you know, tell stories in a way that hadn't been told in the exhibit space um, and kind of lean in harder to the narrative storytelling aspect of it um, to help people, you know, feel like they had a better sense of the experience of the people whose lives we were trying to, to share. Um, and we just, it was, it was a different way to tell a story, um, but it was also a way that's easier in some cases to be used in classrooms or, you know, to help reach people who are interested in history, but might not be as excited about going to a museum. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, especially with some communities, it's harder to go to mm -hmm. a plantation. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, so hearing these stories and yeah. having access to things like Spotify or the mm -hmm. website mm -hmm. allows more people to do that. So that's awesome. And I really appreciate that. Yeah. And it's, it's really an important point too, because as we said, you know, not everyone's going to come to Northern Virginia. Mm -hmm. And so we get about a million visitors a year to Mount Vernon and only a certain percentage goes to these special exhibits. Mm -hmm. And so, every, you know, people are, are self-selecting when they go into an exhibit like Lives Bound Together. And so by turning it into a podcast, as Janet was saying, we are able to reach a much wider audience and, and tune into a medium that more people are using frequently. Uh, and you know, you can take history in your pocket with a podcast and in ways that you uh, not necessarily can by going to an exhibit. And it was just a, a way to leverage these emerging technologies and not emerging. I mean, they've been around for a while, but you know, historians uh, have in a very real sense seeded the ground of pod, uh, history podcasting to journalists. And so uh, we wanted to see if we could make a contribution uh, in that space. Yeah, nice. And so even with both of you being historians, what was it like in making this podcast? <laughs> if you had any background in it already or anything like that? Uh, neither of us had any background in this type of neither. podcast. Um, there, Malvern has another podcast that Jim hosts that's an interview style show. Um, and you know, I came at it as a public historian, and so I had experience 
researching and writing non-traditional based pieces. So whether it was web content or video scripts, um, you know, just different pieces of content that was specifically targeted at mm -hmm. a general public audience, um, but had not written a scripted podcast before. And so, you know, we started like with most good projects as a story and doing a lot of reading and research. We were, you know, fortunate to have a really great exhibit um, and, you know, a team of people at Mount Vernon who were also familiar with the content. Um, but then, you know, we spent a lot of time looking at the new pieces of work that had come out um, since the mm -hmm. exhibit had been up. And, you know, we, we spent a lot of time researching and writing and listening to other shows, most of which had been created by journalists and thinking about, you know, what made these really interesting to listen to and why did we, you know, enjoy certain history podcasts that, you know, what, what was the soundscapes that really drew us in. Um, and so we, we spent a lot of time doing mm -hmm. non-traditional research too. Yeah. yeah, it was, it was tough. Um, you know, when you're dealing with, a, a medium like a video or a podcast, you only have maybe a couple of minutes to keep the audience engaged before you, before they make a choice to stay with you or leave. And it's different than a book, right? Where you know they they might give you the benefit of a doubt of forty pages in a chapter, um, but you've only got a few seconds, literally, to try to get an audience interested. So we, I don't know how many podcasts we listened to oh. to figure out what we were going to do. But then how you take the kind of um, what we're taught to do as historians and on the page and translate it into audio form to build tension in the narrative that captivates an audience to use sources and our primary sources in a sense were our contributors how do you interweave those folks with narrative so that you are telling a story and bringing forward the best scholarly contributions we can we also listen to a lot of music you know trying to figure out what what's the tone of the show you know how do we want this to hear what you know how do we want this to hear in our heads and what we want people to hear as well? How do we create those emotional moments for people that really captivate them and, and drive home the points we were trying to make? And I think we spent a lot of time thinking about who should narrate the show. Mm -hmm. um, and because we knew it would not be either of us. Um, and we were fortunate to have a great colleague in Brenda Parker, who um, was the coordinator of African American History and Special Projects at Mount Vernon. Um, a, a scholar as well. She, you know, mm -hmm. has done so much research, but then also has a theater background. And so, you know, she had never voiced a podcast before, but had this amazing theater experience that we were then able to, you know, tap into. And, you know, she was a critical part in ensuring that she also agreed with the accuracy of the scripts, but mm -hmm. then in how we, you know, rewrote things so that it could be in her voice. Um, and that she was comfortable with everything that we were literally putting into her mouth. Um, but then just having the added advantage of her being able to build that drama and that tension um, with her, her theater experience. Yeah, and we, it was very much a collaboration because in speaking of rewriting, I mean, we wrote whole, sec we wrote whole sections of scripts based on you know, insight that Brenda had gleaned from you know, her, uh, not only her theater work, but her character interpretation, the research that she had done uh, I mean, we wrote a whole, we wrote a whole sec, uh, sequence in episode three about William Lee and his clothing based on, uh, you know, the ideas and the research that she brought to the table. And so, you know, that show's not happening without Brenda Parker. Yeah, it sounds like there was a lot of teamwork. <laughs> yeah, yes. so yeah. absolutely. So many yeah. Different yes. You guys had a lot of people um, who spoke <laughs> in that. I was very impressed. Yeah. I was like, wow, there's people from all over the place. And so even talking about more now the content of the, mm -hmm. the podcast, even as you scroll through the different episodes, you see that there's different themes right. um, for each episode, like resisting or there's um, legacies. Mm -hmm. And so how did you guys come up with those mm -hmm. themes? Why did you choose those things specifically to go through those stories? Yeah, I think we started by looking at the themes the exhibit um, was kind of framed around um, to use those as, as in the initial inspiration. Um, and so as we were thinking through those ideas, we were also thinking about, um, you know, what types of questions do we know that visitors ask as they are learning um, about Washington's roles with the institution of slavery and his relationship with this community. Mm -hmm. And we, we knew that there were a lot of questions that many people who were struggling to accept this side of Washington would always come back to. Um, and so we wanted to help the listeners really contextualize Washington within this time. Because um, a common question is, or is something to the extent of like, but it was, it was just happening. Like it, he couldn't have stopped this or, you know, it was just the context that he was in. And so we wanted to 
help people who we knew might struggle with this side of his life, um, kind of guiding them into you know, what the research say and what historians say. Um, and so that's why we started kind of back with passages before we were even at Mount Vernon or looking at the 18th century specifically. But we wanted to really help people you know, start kind of at how, where this, the, the larger context is and then you know, use Mount Vernon as the case study and the example, but very much you know, have it framed within the larger world. Um, but then the point of the show was looking at the actual experience mm -hmm. of this community of people. Um, and so then a lot of the other themes were shaped around their life and their experiences and then what their experiences looked like after the Washingtons are no longer at Mount Vernon. Yeah, I think a critical choice that we made because we we didn't necessarily just want to replicate the exhibit. Like we wanted it to be its own thing. We wanted it to be in part ours. Uh, and so we adopted the thematic portions, uh, right? But then we, uh, I think, made a really good choice in framing each episode around an individual person's life in order for the audience to have some grounding, right? So that's not, we're not introducing tons of people uh, so that people can remain centered. But then it also gives us a chance to say their names repeatedly, to uh, give their life stories the best that we can tell from the available evidence. Uh, and uh, you know, give them uh, you know the, the, their due in a very real sense. Uh, you know, make them sort of the forefront of the show, as opposed to uh, uh, you know sometimes off to the side, as often can be the case, and has often been in past interpretations at other sites of enslavement. Uh, and I mean, I learned a ton. Uh, it was beneficial for me, I think, and beneficial for all of us by you know, learning about Sambo Anderson and Kate and Caroline Branham and William Lee and all these folks who live these rich and full lives with very complicated lives uh, and uh, hopefully educate other people about their lives as well. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really cool to even see that uh, even as I was listening to the podcast, that was one of the first things I noticed was like, oh, they're using the stories of these enslaved mm -hmm. peoples to really show like slavery in America, <laughs> right. um, in early America and see that there's, you know, just not this generalization mm -hmm. of there was resisting, but like this right. specific person resisted mm -hmm. here at Mount Vernon um, and persevered. And so one of the stories that really did impact me was the story of Ona Judge mm -hmm. and her resistance. She's in that episode, um, I believe it's episode five, Correct. Um, mm -hmm. resisting and just her story. And so would y'all be able to, one, summarize somewhat um, who Ona Judge was, and then we have a clip um, from that episode, episode five, um, about Ona Judge. So if either of y'all want to. Yeah, so Ona Judge uh, was born in about 1774 to Betty and, uh, and then a white man named uh, Andrew Judge, who was a tailor. Uh, and she belonged to the Custis estate. So she belonged to the family of Martha Washington, uh, her first husband. Uh, and so when Martha Washington's first husband died, she had a widow's right to one third of her late husband's property that included enslaved people, that included land. So she legally controlled them, but she didn't legally own them and neither did George Washington. Uh, she becomes the maid servant to Martha. Uh, she's a very prominent uh, individual in the household, particularly in Philadelphia during the presidency in the 1790s. Uh, and in May of 1796, Ona Judge uh, uh, decides to risk self-emancipation. Uh, and she, uh, one evening while the Washingtons are eating dinner and, and, and uh, and uh, entertaining their guests, she slips out into the streets of Philadelphia. She gets on board a ship that goes to New Hampshire, and she manages to remain free for the most of the rest of her life, um, despite Washington's best efforts to try to recapture her and re-enslave her. And it's uh, it's one of the only times we have the words of an individual enslaved person uh, in their own words, because she gives an interview in the 1840s, as we can talk about, I think, uh, probably after the clip. thing is that years later, after she's been able to live as a free woman, she was interviewed in the 1840s when she was quite elderly. And all this time she had legally been living as a fugitive because she was owned by the Custis estate. Even though George Washington chooses to free the enslaved people he owned in his will, that didn't apply to her. Technically, she and her children could have been seized by the Custis heirs at any point. It doesn't seem that they attempted to find her, but she surely lived with the knowledge that that was a possibility. 
In the 1840s, she's interviewed about her experiences, and it's one of the only times that we actually have the voice of an enslaved person in the historical record. And she again reiterates that she ran away because she wanted to be free, that the Washingtons hadn't provided her with any type of education. But as a free woman, she had been able to learn to read and write. She had joined a church and found religion. And she was asked if she regretted running away because her life had been so hard since. And she said, no, because I'm free and have been made a child of God. So it's this incredible window into the risks that enslaved people were willing to take to emancipate themselves, the hardships that many of them endured afterwards, even when they were free, and how that sacrifice was worth it to be able to live life as a free person. Awesome. So I hope y'all could hear that. But that story actually really did impact me a lot just hearing there are multiple times throughout actually the podcast where I got a little emotional just listening. Um, but just that story of how I think a lot of people try to come up with this reasoning of like, oh, enslaved peoples like didn't try or if they didn't try to escape, it's because like they were loyal or whatever it may have been. Um, but even hearing this story of Ona Judge and knowing that she knew she deserved to be emancipated, she deserved to be in freedom and she went to live that life outside of uh, being owned by the Washingtons um, and built her own life there. And um, even though it may have been a struggle outside mm -hmm. of it, she saw that that's what she wanted to be. Um, and so even that one story really impacted me, um, I think specifically as an African-American person, but I think anyone that's listening to that mm -hmm. would be hit pretty hard by that. But as you mentioned, we know that story from Ona Judge's mm -hmm. own voice. We know that from her. And a great majority of enslaved individuals, not only at Mount Vernon, but at many plantations, we don't know their stories from their perspective, really. And so I ask the questions, how do we know the stories that you guys tell in um, your podcast? We drew from a lot of sources, some of them more traditional sources, but a lot of it was you know, building on the work of other people who were really reading between the lines. Um, Mount Vernon has a great archaeology department, and they had spent a lot of time mm -hmm. excavating sites that um, one of them was called the House for Families, and that cellar and trash pit was only used by the enslaved community. And so they knew everything that they were pulling out of there was somehow connected to someone who was enslaved at Mount Vernon. Um, and so those objects are really important and impactful. Um, looking at Washington's writings and thinking about how the reports that he is making tell different stories. Um, and so, you know, he might be angry and upset that people aren't working as hard or as fast as he wants to, or, you know, he's mad that they're ill. Well, you know, if you read them a different way, that's, you know, someone might actually be ill or they might be faking sick. They might be, you know, intentionally working slower, you know, showing that, you know, they had choice and agency in their life and, you know, making decisions mm -hmm. to, you know, bring back control into it. Um, you know, looking at the objects from different perspectives. So instead of, you know, looking at the fine piece of China as, you know, this beautiful vessel that the Washingtons and their guests were, you know, drinking out of, thinking about all of the hands that actually used and touched it and, you know, played a larger role in that piece's life. Um, you know, there's um, advertisements that get placed when, when a judge runs away that describe her physical description. Um, and so, you know, just different pieces like that help us understand a little bit more, even though there are rarely, you know, pieces actually written in their voices. Yeah, I think pulling in sources inside out is a great way to, to look at it. Uh, you know, Jesse McLeod, who was the curator of, of Lives Bound Together and is a prominent contributor to the show, she tells and this wonderful... I'm sorry. And the voice that and, and, you and, heard. Exactly. And she... She uh, tells this wonderful story uh, in one of the episodes about a punch bowl. Mm -hmm. uh, and traditionally, you know, you interpret a punch bowl as something that's used for hospitality. Uh, it's going to be at a fancy dinner. You're not going to think too much about it. But then if you start to pull that source inside out, not only do you realize that enslaved hands are helping to serve that meal, but the punch that's going in there features sugar grown in the Caribbean by enslaved hands. And so there is a direct connection with that punch bowl to the transatlantic slave trade, to the intercolonial trade in sugar, and then to the sociability and hospitality the Washingtons are displaying. And so if you think about it like that, you can see a lot more movement and a lot more voices and a lot more stories hidden in that punch bowl than you might not uh, normally recognize. Yeah. And so even going to 
the podcast is called Intertwined. And so going to how like the lives of the enslaved mm -hmm. peoples are literally intertwined with the lives of the Washingtons, George and Martha. And even as you listen through the podcast, you can see that Washington kind of had these eras in his mm -hmm. life where he changes his ways of thought specifically and practices of like agriculture mm -hmm. um, and how he wants his plantation set up, but also um, slavery and him being involved in that institution. And so I was wondering if you guys can mm -hmm. touch on some of those, I guess, first the agriculture aspect, right. and then afterwards, uh, post-Revolutionary War, Jefferson's mm -hmm. views on slavery. Yeah, both the, the agricultural aspect and the, the American revolutionary aspect are very critical. <clears throat> um, to start with agriculture, and here's a great example of where we took recent scholarship to uh, build the podcast. And so our colleague, Bruce Ragsdale, who's written a marvelous book called Washington at the Plow. And it's about Washington's obsession with agriculture, but it's more importantly about Washington's it, it, uh, obsession with something called the new husbandry or the new agriculture. And so it's a phenomenon in the 18th century where uh, British gentlemen are uh, changing the way that they do agriculture. Uh, they are bringing more acreage under cultivation with different kinds of grains. They are growing more fodder for their animals. They are trying to create uh, sites of industrialization to kind of you know, make farms self-sufficient in a sense. Uh, but they also have all of these tenants who then are paying uh, the, the, the great farmer in rent, uh, in cash or in crop. Washington is very culturally English throughout his entire life. It's ironic, right? He's leading general of the American Revolution, but he, and he wants that British red coat as a young man. And in some ways, he never stops being British, particularly when it comes to agriculture. And so beginning in the 1760s, he begins to move away from tobacco because it just doesn't grow well in terms of the kind that people like in, in Northern Virginia. Uh, it begins to grow wheat, but then begins to restructure Mount Vernon before the war, but particularly after, so that he is growing more cereals. He is uh, creating a regimented system of labor that defines you know, certain tasks and where they need to be done. He is building out his industrial enterprise. Uh, but he begins to realize that this is not uh, in, in the true mode of an English gentleman because he has enslaved people. And so no one is paying him rent, really. But he is expending huge capital sums maintaining an enslaved labor force. and so. It's not economically viable. Uh, and so that's like the one, that one revolution that begins to turn in his mind. The second is the big capital R revolution, the American Revolution, where uh, you know, the Thomas Jefferson, uh, who authored the Declaration of Independence, uh, is, is you know, issuing a document claiming you know, liberty and freedom for Americans who were impressed by the tyrant George III. Uh, that war creates uh, a number of opportunities for enslaved people to try to make good on those promises of liberty and freedom through self-emancipation, but also uh, in states like Pennsylvania, in New York, other places, you start to see gradual, gradual abolition uh, laws take effect. But what's also happening is Washington is generally seeing uh, African-Americans serve in armies. He's seeing uh, African-Americans die for the revolutionary cause, uh, for that promise of liberty. And then after the war, he is getting relentlessly hammered by people like the Marquis de Lafayette, he is being excoriated in newspapers. Uh, he is being entreated in private correspondence to end slavery, at least his involvement in it. You know, Lafayette says, how can we have a project of liberty with slavery? You, you fought this revolution in this name, uh, and you are still perpetuating it. And so those two sort of agricultural revolutions and the political revolution that takes place in the United States begin to reshape how he thinks about it and whether or not he wants to be involved in it, whether or not it's economically viable, and whether or not it's, it's morally viable. And, and he begins to make certain choices by the end of his life to affect the emancipation of those that he owns outright. But of course, he can legally do nothing with those who belong uh, to Martha Washington and her family. Yeah. And so even with all that you spoke about, the lives of the enslaved peoples is intertwined mm -hmm. with the Washingtons. Mm -hmm. And then going on with this intertwined theme, the lives of enslaved peoples are also intertwined with the land mm -hmm. of right. Mount Vernon as they were living and laboring there, mm -hmm. but their lives are also in, intertwined with each other, these families. And so in the podcast and some of the episodes, there are some descendants mm -hmm. um, of the enslaved families that labored at uh, Mount Vernon, I was gonna say Mon Monticello, <laughs> um, but some descendants also speak and tell their stories mm -hmm. and tell the stories of their ancestors 
And so how did, I don't know if you guys had like um, yourselves been in contact with like descendants and things like that beforehand and been able to listen to those stories, but how did those stories told by the descendants, how did those highlight the lives of the enslaved peoples that were at Mount Vernon? Yeah, we were fortunate to be able to interview a number of people connected to Mount Vernon's descendant community. Um, and for the original exhibit, a group of them had also been included into it. So we had, we had a group of stories that we were you know, familiar with and able to connect with episode themes and topics. But really, you know, we thought it was incredibly important to let these people tell their family mm -hmm. stories um, from you know, their perspective and to talk about yeah, how their lives are connected to Mount Vernon today, but how their families have been connected to it and just, you know, what, what it meant to them and, you know, what, you know, it, what that legacy felt like to them and, you know, what, what items some of them had been given and had been physically passed down. But then, you know, I think it's Ann Chen talks about, you know, what her family brings out of slavery is not nothing tangible, but it is, you know, these, central like core identity things that you know are really central to who she and her family are and that she can trace that legacy um, through their enslavement and so you know we were just so fortunate mm -hmm. that they allowed us to interview them and tell their stories um, because I think that that's also a piece that people don't always think about is that you know there are still families connected to these sites mm -hmm. that you know are alive and part of you know communities today and some of them are actively part of historic sites and other people are not because they don't want to visit or they don't feel welcome um, or if they're there they feel like their families are being ignored and so we wanted to make sure that you know that there was an opportunity given um, because I mean th this is not these are not our family stories right. they are theirs mm -hmm. but you know we wanted to give them the platform to be able to talk yeah. about it yeah. And so even with the descendants, it was awesome listening to them tell these stories as I'm like working on the Getting Word project. Mm -hmm. um, and a part of the project, it's in the oral history project. And so part of it is collecting these stories that um, these descendants have. And the original goal was to like collect stories that they know about their ancestors, mm -hmm. in which a lot of them don't. <laughs> they don't yeah. know what life was like being enslaved because a lot of people did not want to talk about slavery mm -hmm. once they were emancipated. But a lot of the stories that they do have reflect these values that have been carried mm -hmm. on throughout uh, the centuries, like you had mentioned. Um, and so it's cool to see, even as I've had the chance to listen to these interviews that were conducted 10 plus years ago, hear these families talk about mm -hmm. the value of family, the mm -hmm. value of education, mm -hmm. the value of advocating for people's rights and their uh, relatives being involved in things like the civil rights movement. And so it's cool to see that things that we really, or themes that we really highlight yeah. with like the founding fathers like mm -hmm. Washington um, and Jefferson, these are also very prominent amongst the enslaved mm -hmm. community and how we've seen all those things be carried out. And so it's really awesome to, you know, hear that often from uh, Monticello, but also be able to see it at Mount Vernon mm -hmm. and see how we're able to highlight the lives of the enslaved people um, who were quite prominent <laughs> um, in how mm -hmm. the plantation was able to be carried out. Well, we actually got to tour Monticello today, and we you know, stopped by the, the Getting Word exhibit. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's it's great. I mean, yeah. it's, and it's as you point out, it's such important work. And um, and so keep up the good work. <laughs> yes. We're trying. <laughs> awesome. And so we'll now go on to uh, the audience Q and A. If there are any questions, I'm getting messages that there may be. <laughs> and so if you do again have questions, please do feel free to. Um, send them in. Um, and so, awesome. And so, let me see. So, someone asks, the podcast is wonderful and so full of information. Um, are you willing, are you pulling out excerpts like Ona Judge's story or Washington's interest in agriculture and sharing as standalone shorts? It's a really great question. And yes, there is a, technically a season two that we call Intertwined Stories, where we took uh, excerpts from the, some of the interviews. I think we've got 10 of them. Uh, because we, we wanted, we had, we had like, I don't know, 35 hours of audio. Uh, and from just the interviews. It was it's, amazing. It's, uh, it, it, interviewing is great. It was like listening to stories all the time. And so we wanted the opportunity to, to you know, to have some of those extended interviews. And so it, when the main show ended in December of 21, 
we were like, well, okay, what are we going to do now? Uh, because we've got all this great stuff. And so we've, uh, we've got uh, great uh, extended interviews with the descendants, like Judge Wilhelmine Quander, uh, episodes that focus on Martha, episodes that focus an extended interview with Ramin Granisham on Hercules Posey's self-emancipation in 1797. So after you get done with the main course, uh, check out Dessert, and uh, uh, you'll find some more good fodder there. Nice. <laughs> Yeah, it was, I got to listen to a couple of um, those episodes and it was cool to, even the one about Hercules, mm -hmm. um, it was cool to listen to specifically how the historian talked mm -hmm. about that story because she gets so excited right. <laughs> um, about what she's learning. And so even listening to that second season um, kind of gave me a little bit of like being on a fly on the mm -hmm. wall yeah. of like these historians and these descendants and archaeologists. Mm -hmm. Um, curators who are learning themselves and being so ecstatic about this information that they're learning. And it's like, wow, I want to be there. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so it's just awesome to see people doing this work and being excited um, about mm -hmm. doing this work. I don't know if there are right. any other questions. So Great far. question. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yes, no. Okay, cool. And so yeah, again, please do go and listen to, if you haven't, the first season um, of Intertwined and also the second season. They also have an episode um, in the first season that's just the music. Mm -hmm. Soundtrack, yeah. Good. Yeah, the soundtrack, yeah. and I was like, kind of grooving to it. Um, <laughs> it's really good. Um, just like, I don't know, the whole making of it is just so interesting to me, and I hope that we also have a podcast here at Monticello, but it would be cool to have a similar thing um, yeah. specifically focused on the enslaved community um, and getting descendants and all these people mm -hmm. involved. Um, but I do just want to thank you guys for all that you have been doing. But I know that you guys, though this podcast uh, and this series may be over, that you have your own work that you might be doing. And so what can we look forward to um, from you guys? Um, so I now work at George Mason University and run R2 Studios, which is a podcast studio that creates similar style of shows. Um, and so we have a few shows out right now, um, but we have a new show that we're announcing tomorrow. Um, so if you go to r2studios.org, um, we have a new one that's coming out that might be of interest to some of your listeners. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so we are presently working on three shows right now in addition to our normal uh, conversations at the Washington Library, which is our interview program. So we're working on one about Washington and the presidency and how Washington tried to figure out how to be president. Uh, we're working on one that'll come out in a couple of years on the, uh, it's a women's history podcast using the spaces of Mount Vernon to tell those stories. And then, uh, and this is all being done in conjunction with my colleagues, Ann Furtick and Sam Snyder. And then we're working on a third, which will be a short video series, but also an extended podcast on uh, some of the books that Washington and Martha, uh, George and Martha Washington had owned and what those texts have to tell us about not only their own lives, but about the 18th century. Uh, and so we're, we've got a lot going on and we're very excited about it. And so folks can go to georgewashingtonpodcast.com uh, if you'd like to check out both Intertwine and Conversations and then eventually these, these future shows. Awesome. So I lastly just want to read a review <laughs> um, that was given to the podcast just to get you guys even more hyped. Is it a good um, one? <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> no, it's going to be a bad one. No. Um, yeah, it's a good one. So this person wrote a review and it says, if you're searching for an in-depth look into the history of the enslaved community at George Washington's Mount Vernon, look no further. This offers both an academic history of slavery during Washington's time while simultaneously weaving an emotional storyline of the lives of the individuals and families enslaved by George and Martha will definitely make you think about the Washingtons and Mount Vernon in a new light. Kudos to the team for putting this out in the podcast world. And so not only myself, but so many others do really, really appreciate what y'all did. Um, and I look forward to what you're coming out with, you know, announcing <laughs> tomorrow and further. Um, and so thank you. Thank you so much for all the work that y'all did and all your colleagues did behind the scenes and the people that you interviewed um, that gave us all that information. And so lastly, lastly, um, we do have, you know, more live streams with Monticello. And so next Tuesday on September 20th, we're going to be having a live stream about Thomas Jefferson's mill at Shadwell. And so you can find it in the same places um, that we have all our other live streams. Um, if you're interested, highly recommend. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. And that is it. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much, Thanks. Jenna.